and we still and we will send out a copy of the recording what it, once it is completed. Second, there will be a very short Q&A. Uh, there will be a short Q&A period at the end of the webinar, uh, as well as a very short survey for you to let us know, uh, send us some feedback, and uh, request for additional information. We also welcome you to use the questions box in your webinar screen to submit any questions that you have throughout the webinar. Uh, we will circle back to these questions as, as best we can at the end of the webinar um, and, make, and do our best to answer them. Uh, with that, I will turn over the webinar and the presentation to my colleague, Samantha Tran. Thanks so much, Eduardo, and uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, again, my name is Samantha Tran. I'm the Senior Managing Director for Education at Children Now, and uh, it was really exciting to look at the registration list. We have over 130 organizations represented, um, including groups that are on the ground working directly with schools and districts and communities doing organizing work. Um, there's a number of partners who uh, do state policy work. Um, there's philanthropy and um, uh, educators, uh, both at the district level and the county office level. So uh, a, a good gathering of folks really focused on equity up and down the state um, uh, joining us today. Um, as part of this webinar, I'm uh, joined by Rob Manwaring, who is a senior policy and fiscal advisor here at Children Now, um, and uh, has a very good sense of the, the fiscal dynamic here in California, and so talk a, a, with us a little bit, um, as well as Luz Cardez, um, who is a consultant with Children Now, um, and also the founding partner for Lucid Partnerships. Um, she um, uh, previously was a chief business officer um, in a school district and the county office and just really understands how uh, fiscal impact issues uh, play out at the local level and so will give us some advice and counsel today. Um, sorry, okay, so that's the slide with uh, the different participants. And then um, in terms of what we want to accomplish today, we're hoping to talk through a few things. One is to give you a sense of the revenue picture and what that means um, as we move forward in um, our LCFF uh, dynamic with the, the funding formula. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And um, then we'll shift gears and talk a bit about what's happening uh, or what has happened at the federal level um, that is going to require some increased transparency at the school site uh, front. So um, we'll talk about some of those requirements and, and then dig into a little bit around strategy. So what does this mean at the local level in terms of planning efforts, and um, local advocacy. And so we'll, um, we'll have some conversation along those lines. And we're really hoping, uh, while we've pulled together a PowerPoint and we'll have some visuals for you to look at, that this will be more of a conversation uh, style approach. So you'll hear a lot of um, Q and A uh, between the three of us as we move forward. Um, so first, let me set the stage and talk a little bit about why now. Um, some of you may be wondering, it's like, well, we're just coming off of the budget. Um, and the, you know, the bills getting signed, you know, schools getting up and running, you know, why is it important to have uh, this conversation at this moment? And for those of you who've joined our webinars, who've been part of um, other presentations that we've done, uh, you know that we often talk about the budget as the seasons of the budget. Um, and um, noting that this time of year is a really important time of year um, because there's this opportunity for reflection. There's an opportunity to look at uh, what impact uh, various uh, activities and strategies have played out at the local level um, and reflect. And actually along those lines, um, we're hearing from the state that the uh, school accountability dashboard um, that was launched earlier this year will be updated and all the new data will be posted um, and available to the public by November 27th. So um, th there's a lot of opportunities to, to look at that information and again, kind of reflect about you know, where kids are at and, and how, um, how children are doing. Um, and at the same time, start thinking big picture. You know, what, what is our vision? Uh, how do we need to refine our vision um, based on the, the outcomes we're seeing? Um, and so we really think that this time of year is a good opportunity for community groups and educators uh, to have some of those bigger picture conversations. Um, because as we start moving into the winter and spring, um, you know, by necessity, the conversation needs to narrow. It needs to get much more focused on how much resources do we actually have, what are the specific strategies we're going to get put in place um, to get to a point where you can actually adopt a budget and an LCAP. Um, so all, all to say that now are, is a good time 
uh, to have those, those um, broader conversations and, and begin engaging one another. Um, so, you know, now that we've kind of talked about why now, um, we want to shift gears a little bit and, and uh, talk about revenue and LCFF. And in particular, uh, you know, over the last several years as we've uh, moved to implement LCFF, uh, a lot of the policy conversation focuses on, you know, reaching the LCFF target and so, um, and that target funding level. And so, Rob, um, could you talk to us a little bit about, uh, about what that means? Sure, Sam. Uh, so, so just to give you a little bit of history, so when, when the transition to LCFF happened, um, the state wanted to set these somewhat ambitious targets that, that we would get to over time. Um, and basically the way it worked was we set these high targets um, and then each year the state would fill in a portion of the gap. Um, and so this gap consists of two things. It consists of a gap in base funding from the base target and a gap in supplemental and concentration funding from the supplemental and concentration target. So these percentages, in the, in, for example, in 2013-14, we were able to close 12% of the gap. Now it was a really large gap, so 12% was, was a substantial chunk of money. Um, you can see as you get to the, the right-hand side of this chart that um, we are now 97% funded, and this last year, although we didn't provide a huge amount of LCFF funding, we closed 43% of the gap. So the little gray gap at the top is what's left to get us to full implementation. And right now that number is, sits right around $1.7 billion. Um, that means that we're actually in range that in the next budget that will come out in January, there's a reasonable chance that um, we could close the rest of the gap. And we'll get into why that might be important, but, but so understanding, you know, how many resources, um, and, and just to give you some reflections, so far, this has been a pretty good fiscal year from revenues. Um, education funding is driven uh, directly by what happens to the general fund revenues that come into the state. Um, revenues are up uh, beyond projections. Uh, the, the Brown administration has been uh, consistently conservative in their revenue estimates so that they don't overexpose the state and then end up in a deep recession and, and have to make massive cuts again. So they've been pretty conservative with their budgeting. Um, one advantage of that is that um, they tend to underestimate, which means that after the fact, we'll end up providing a bunch of extra money to schools. And so between now and next May, it's likely you'll hear a lot about getting to full implementation of LCFF um, and making that transition to what comes after that. So. So along those lines, Rob, can you talk to us a little bit about um, why that, that matters? I mean, what, what impact do you think it's going to have on, on local conversations, on how funding is distributed? Um, you know, what's going to be the difference? Well, so there's going to be two differences here. Um, first of all, during this transition period, it's been pretty hard to figure out what was going on with the formula, especially um, for supplemental and concentration funds. Um, so, and one of, the, one of the big challenges of LCFF implementation has been that really the base which drives this whole system is pretty much inadequate to address all the pressures on the base. So, school districts annually have been facing um, dramatic increases in their, in their teacher and employee pension costs. Um, the local share of costs that, that districts have to pay for special education um, and anything related to changes in teacher compensation, all of those things tend to fall on the base. Um, and the base hasn't been growing quickly enough in the last few years to cover those cost pressures, which has pushed districts to, to struggle with how to use their supplemental and concentration dollars because of all these pressures on the base. Once we get to full implementation, we'll actually be able to ratchet up the base faster, which then ratchets up the whole system. Um, a, a second issue is um, that, that we're going to get some transparency benefits when we get to full implementation. Um, and so, um, so right now, 
it, it's a proportion of the gap from what you were spending last year to your target. And it gets kind of convoluted on how this plays out, particularly for supplemental and concentration dollars. Once you get to full implementation, it's a formula. It's a state formula. The state can tell each and every district, here's how much base running you have, here's how much supplemental and concentration running you have. And at the local level, what that means is it's, it will be a good time to reflect on, all right, your district is getting $40 million in supplemental and concentration funds. How are those resources being used? Um, so, so that has been lacking. Most of the focus over the implementation phase is what are you doing with the marginal increase in supplemental and concentration dollars happening in this particular year's budget? Uh, once you get to full implementation, you'll be able to take that step back and say, here's what the formula says we're getting in supplemental and concentration dollars. What's happening with that money? Um, so, you want to go to the next slide, Edwina? Yeah, let's ping up the next visual so you can kind of talk through that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so this slide says there's one additional uh, transition that's going to happen as we get to full implementation. So during the implementation, when we started off this LCFF adventure, um, there was a lot of base funding, but there was almost no funding really targeted at disadvantaged kids. So there was something called the Economic Impact Aid Program. There were some other small categorical programs that were focused at, at, at our, what is referred to as unduplicated populations, so low-income kids, English learners, and foster youth. But there wasn't a substantial amount of funding. So during the initial transition period, a huge portion, roughly 40% is the statewide average, of new revenues were going in to supplemental and concentration purposes. Um, that meant that there wasn't a lot going into the base, you know, in relative terms to all the pressures on the base, and this has caused a lot of the conflict at the local level. As we transition post-formula, this dynamic really changes because now it goes to what is your average unduplicated funding? Um, and so, so we're going to have a, a, a slower growth in supplemental concentration because we don't have to catch up. We're now investing substantially in, in these targeted populations. And so it'll just, both, both sides of the equation will grow uh, in proportion to each other. Um, so, so that's going to be a transition that's going to be happening potentially as early as this next budget. Thanks, Rob. So that hopefully gives folks a, um, a picture of kind of the statewide context around um, state resources, and, and we can pick up some questions uh, towards the end, too, if folks have a particular um, uh, queries about, about any of that information. Um, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the new uh, federal requirements. And um, in particular, in the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, uh, there was a provision that shifted uh, the common practice that um, now is uh, prevailing uh, across the nation in terms of how we, um, we uh, share the expenditures that are happening at a school site level. So historically, the way this would play out is um, there were you know, some, some actual expenditures for the school site and then um, a lot of averages, you know, district-wide district, district -wide averages were then applied to, to the school site level, and then that was what was reported in, say, for example, your school accountability report, report card or in other mechanisms that the, the state had to look at um, site-level resources. Federal law now requires that um, school districts and the state move to a reporting mechanism that looks at actual expenditures. And so um, moving away from those district averages um, and, and reporting it in, in this new way. And uh, while there's a real opportunity there to have um, some good conversations about resource allocation, uh, we will note that this is going to be a big lift. It's going to be um, a transition for, for districts um, and the state in terms of how we get there. And um, in particular, you know, trying to figure out how to define different, um, different expenditures. And, and Luce will talk a little bit in more detail about this this issue and some of the, the work that's going to need to happen in the, um, the coming months. Um, the other thing to note is that um, while the state could conceivably come in and um, provide guidance on those definitions, um, it's not clear that they will. Um, so, so that's something that, that we have to be mindful of, that, that districts 
um, and charter entities across the, the state um, and county offices may, may need to be coming up with their own definitions and figuring this out locally. So Sam, Children Now sponsored some legislation in this area to, to help clarify this process. What happened to that legislation and, and is there anything that could happen at the state level that basically does something similar without legislation? Right, and, and many of the folks on, on this call um, were actually uh, supporters of that, that piece of legislation. Um, so you, you may remember it, it's uh, AB 1321. It's a, um, um, some legislation we co-sponsored with the Education Trust West and uh, Dr. Shirley Weber, uh, the assembly authored it. Um, you know, it, the, the legislation itself received, you know, pretty broad-based support from, from local groups and, and statewide groups, um, and you received unanimous support out of the assembly and, and bipartisan support in the Senate Education Committee. Um, that said, you know, in the Appropriations Committee, it, it died a quiet death, which is often the place where, where these things happen without fingerprints. So I think it, you know, it's indicative of, you know, there's still consternation about um, moving in this direction and, um, and you know, providing um, certainly statewide parameters uh, around these definitions. Um, that said, you know, the, the, there is an opportunity for the state agency to, to CDE to, to develop um, some guidance. Um, but again, this, this may ultimately be upon local districts and local community groups uh, to have those conversations. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about, about what the opportunities are there um, in that context. And, but before I do that, let me talk a little bit about the timing um, so you have, have um, some context for this. So um, as we mentioned, you know, this is a, a real uh, opportunity to look at whether or not Title I, Title III, supplemental and concentration dollars are, are by and large getting to the students who generate them, and especially when you start looking at, at schools with high proportions of high need kids, um, you know, how those allocations are happening. In addition, it'll give you a sense potentially of looking at um, whether or not we're getting equal access to the base across, across schools, which can support local conversations about, uh, about investment strategies and, and connecting that to, um, you know, how students are doing and, and um, the activities we have in play. Um, the reason this is important and to, important to bring up now is bec between now and July of 2018, these definitions are going to have to be created, right? So essentially, you know, how, how districts are going to account for different um, uh, expenditures, you know, what, what are the mechanisms that they are going to use, because starting July 1st, 2018, all the way through that fiscal year of July 30th, 2019, the data is going to be collected, right? And you're not going to change the rules of the game while you're in, in, in the process of collecting the data. Um, once that fiscal year is over, there's likely going to be several months where people are, you know, going to be certifying the data, making sure it's um, it's it sound, such that uh, we think no later than probably January of 2020, um, that information will be available. And uh, as all of you know, that's well timed with when the LCAP process happens locally and. Um, you know, when, when budgets and LCAP planning uh, starts really kicking into gear. And so um, while that may seem forever away, um, one, time clips by pretty quickly, and two, um, as you mentioned, the, the definitions are being set now. So um, the clarity you have around the information you get in January 2020 is going to be, be determined in the ensuing months. Um, so, you know, now with all of that kind of background on, on what the, you know, what the federal dynamics are and, and the timing, let's shift gears and, and talk a little bit about, um, about the, the, the opportunity here and, and what it might mean locally. And in particular, Luce, I mean, especially given your role as um, a chief business officer, I'd be really curious about your perspective um, around some of the opportunities here for both educators and advocates when they're implementing these new requirements and especially when you think about it from the perspective of um, equity and understanding um, the resources uh, for our most vulnerable kids. Absolutely. Um, I think the whenever there's anything new, um, I encourage folks to engage early and often with your schools and with your districts. Let them know up front why this matters to you, um, how you can serve as a thought partner. Um, and really importantly, um, for those of us who are equity-minded, um, letting them know what your desired outcome is. Be clear that we're not interested in dollars for schools for the sake of knowing the dollars. This is all in the service of 
students, especially our underserved students, and the outcomes we want to see for them. And this idea that parents should be able to find out how much their child's school spends compared to other schools is not a new one, um, and it, it, it runs deep. I think for me, one of the most compelling points I have heard made about the potential value of having per pupil funding by school is that it can take some of the personal feelings out of the hard conversations that need to happen because it is easier to conceptualize inequity when we're talking about dollars. And, and very specifically, Ms. Navas is describing the challenge of advocating for equity without people shutting down because they think they're being called racist. So if poor people spending is going to be a data point or maybe even a vehicle to help us close the opportunity gap, it has to be a meaningful figure. And this is our opportunity to partner with our schools and our districts to make sure that what the figure they develop, the process they use, the methodology they use, gives us ultimately a meaningful figure. Should we move to the next slide, please? So, um, to, to put this in context, I'd like to start off by offering a framework for our thinking. Um, oftentimes, when we think about budget, we think of numbers. Um, and I'd like to submit to you that a budget is not a number. A budget is a story. And to be meaningful, a budget must have numbers, context, and time. A number alone isn't meaningful. It gains its meaning when you compare it to other numbers. And so to provide you with, with a little bit more on this context that I want us to think about, this framework I want us to think about, um, consider, consider the reaction you have um, the questions that come to mind if I tell you La Luna Unified School District is cutting their budget by $4 million. Like the first thought that goes through most of our minds is spending reductions are bad. Um, but there's no context, there's no time to inform, to inform my reaction. I don't know if I should jump off the couch and run to the board meeting to figure out what is going on. Um, now consider your reaction if I tell you La Luna Unified School District is cutting their one billion dollar budget by four million. And that gives me some context. And I'm probably not going to jump off the couch and run to a board meeting for this. Now consider your reaction and the questions that come to mind if I tell you that Luna Unified School District is cutting their hundred million dollar budget by four million dollars after five years of budget reductions totaling eighteen million dollars to date. And with those numbers and that context over time, chances are I probably would not have even made it to my couch. I would have already been at the board meeting. And so if we think about budget and what the numbers mean and how we, how we gain meaning from them, we can't just think about those standalone digits, standalone figures. It has to be the number with some context and time. And that's the framework I want to use as we think about how we partner with our school districts um, and our schools in coming up with a meaningful number for the poor people spending that SNC is now allowing us to. Yeah, along, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say along those lines, I, you know, often when we, we talk about numbers and budget, it, it gets pretty overwhelming. And, you know, just by the sheer fact that, you know, we have Rob on the call who is, you know, formerly at the LAO and running Prop 98 dollars and, you know, you were running school budgets and, you know, deeply understand kind of the fiscal dynamics. I mean, I think it, it absolutely evokes that question of, okay, we're, we're sharing this with local advocates. Does it somehow mean that, that people have to be deep experts in budget in order to, to engage? And, and I, I, Rob, I'd love your thoughts on that and then Luce as well. Well, so, so Luce is giving you some, some concepts to think about. Um, but, but I don't think you need to be a budget expert to start in this process. So, so I think the first key thing in, in, in interacting with your district around this is just let them know that you're paying attention and tell them what you want out of this process. So, so I see this tool as a way for, for stakeholders to understand our base dollars that are coming to the state generally being equitably distributed across all the school sites in a district. And then are the extra programs, supplemental and concentration, uh, Title I funds, and Title II three funds, which are federal funds targeted at, at, at low-income kids and English learners, 
are those funds getting to the sites where the kids uh, that are generating those funds are, are, are going to school? So, so if you simply approach your district and say, look, we, at the end of this, when you, when you do this new reporting, we'd love to be able to use this reporting as information in our future LCAPs to really understand are the dollars generally getting to the kids that are generating them. And just by letting them know that you're paying attention and that you see this as a future tool kind of tells them, you know, like you don't have to understand all the technical details of how they get there. But they know you're watching, and they know that, that this is important. Yeah, along those lines, Luis, love to hear your thoughts as well as um, you know some of the practical advice that you'd give folks to to make this um, accessible and and um, something that's actionable locally. Sure. So if, uh, we can have the next slide. Um, I think I think if we have this framework in mind. Um, and we think about what, what does per pupil spending mean. Um, I want you to think about it as a simple exercise in arithmetic, because I think Rob is absolutely right. We do not need to be a budget expert to, to be able to come up with something, to partner with our school district and come up with something meaningful. Um, and I'm going to stress, per pupil spending is an exercise in arithmetic. It's dollars over dollars. Um, and I want us to remember this because the conversations you will you will have in, in later months with your CBO, with district leadership, will very likely feel more complicated. Um, and there are definitely some complicating factors, and we're going to touch on some of them today. But at its core, we're talking about arithmetic here. We're not talking about calculus. We're not talking about trig. Um, in particular, we're talking about the numerator, the spending portion of the equation, the dollars. What should the numerator include to be meaningful to tell us the story of what happened at a school site? And you know, to Rob's point, um, ask yourself, if I had this data today, if I could compare per pupil spending by school today to improve outcomes for students, how would you use that information? You, know, you think through that process to help guide your, your thinking in this. Um, and I don't want this to be an academic exercise. So, so here's a suggestion. Um, take a look at your SPARC. Your school accountability report cards include per pupil spending figures. What's in them? What do they include? What do they exclude? What do you need them to include to help guide your thinking and your planning about student outcomes? Um, so if we, if we apply this to, to the numbers piece, for example, um, let's think about Think about one of the complicating factors there. So ESSA requires that we disaggregate expenditures by source of funds, meaning federal, state, and local. But if we go back to our question, if I had this data today, what would I want to do with that information? A question I have for you is, would you want to compare the use of supplemental and concentration funds by school? Is that something you would be interested in? Um, and I imagine you might. So that is a request, so that is um, some thinking you would have to take to your district leadership to say, hey, supplemental and concentration funds are special dollars, with special scholars, and they deserve special attention. And it's something that you're interested in seeing um, spelled out in, in the calculation. Um, another place where I think we're going to hit a complicating factor is in the context. Um, there are many services and programs that school districts offer that are either looked, either budgeted and thought of centrally versus site specific versus multiple sites. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna look to special education specifically because I think it's the easiest example to, to think through. Um, if you think about the the service of a director of special education, that service is offered centrally. Teachers and instructional aides tend to be site-specific. Psychologists and therapists tend to serve multiple sites. So if we go back to our question, if I had this data today, what would I want to do with that information? If your district is budgeting all of these positions centrally, does that help you understand the story of what is happening at a particular school site? I would suggest probably not. Um, the story would be missing a critical component of the student population, 
And any principal would tell you that serving our special education population requires commitment of time and energy. Now compare that to a district that is budgeting teachers and aides at their respective school sites, and the director and psychologists and therapists are budgeted centrally. Does that better help you understand the story of what is happening at a school site? And I, I would think it does. Um, the, as looking at times, I'm going to highlight just one more here, and that's the looking at the LCAP piece. I strongly encourage you um, to take a look at your LCAP and find those components of the LCAP that you feel are are absolutely critical to helping close the opportunity gaps in your school and. Those are some of the items you can take forward to your CBO and say, I'd like to understand how we're allocating these dollars. Where are they? Um, so that you can have a sense of are those numbers that are going to show up in a meaningful way to help you understand what is happening at a school site. Um, the time piece um, I want to hit on a little bit here. Um, one of the comparisons that I feel pretty confident that you are going to want to make is year over year. Um, sometimes when we get new requirements, um, we sort of take our best shot at it, knowing that we will have time to sort of adjust and fix over years. Um, this is one of those cases where that's not helpful to to advocates. Um, you want us to you want school districts to get it right and get it right the first time. If we don't get it right the first time and you find us tweaking it year after year after year, it means we're not giving you comparable figures. And so you really do want to put in the energy and effort to, work, to partner with your school districts now to make sure that we come up with a good number that is meaningful to you that you can actually use and compare year after year. Um, if we could see the next slide. As you think about partnering with your school district, um, I've listed off some questions that I think can help start the conversation. Um, and most importantly, these are intended to lay out some of the complicating factors up front. Um, there are absolutely, um, I think, a starting point for you can be looking at that start and then from there working with your with your district um, to see what is in that per people funding and then looking to see if it's in a, if it's in a good um, good place seeing where you can make tweaks to it to get the information that you need. Um, I expect most of you will look at the start and maybe not feel highly satisfied with the number that you're seeing there. Um, but do know that it's a place to start um, and it's a place to continue the conversation based on the, some of the responses you get from your district about where they are budgeting um, the dollars and resources. Um, one, of the, one of the comparisons I do, um, I probably want to stress for you here in this slide, is as a, as a school district, we have a tendency of wanting to allocate resources and staffing based on student numbers. And so if you look at what we do, it tends to be based on formula. And that is very different. It looks very different when we're actually budgeting based on student needs. Um, so as advocates, do feel free to start pushing school districts to start think, to, to ask that question. Are you budgeting based on student numbers? Are you budgeting based on student needs? Because it will look different when, when we answer those questions. That's really helpful, Luce. Um, so uh, along these lines and kind of connected to the timing question, um, you know, what, what do you think are, are reasonable expectations for kind of how long we should ponder these questions when we, we start to reach out and, and begin those conversations with, um, um, between educators and advocates and, you know, who, who should we talk to in the district office? Absolutely. Um, so if we can see the next slide. Um, I think the, I, I said earlier, and I'll say again, do engage early and often. Um, some of the folks you want to talk to are absolutely district leadership folks. So your superintendent, your chief business officer, 
um, school board members, especially those, if, if you happen to have a school board that has a member that seems to be a bit more financially savvy than the others, do approach them. You do, you want them to know that you're, you're paying attention and this is important to you. Um, some of you will have the, um, will have veteran principals who are seasoned sufficiently so they can do the day-to-day -day stuff and do some thinking about new items when they come along. And so if you happen to have some of those principles, do take advantage of them as well. Um, timing, it is, I strongly encourage you to start reaching out now to start those conversations. I think um, to the points made earlier, it is really important for, for folks to know that we are deeply interested and willing to invest ourselves in making sure that we come up with a methodology that gives us a meaningful number at the end. Um, we, we want to get it right, um, and we want to get it right the first time to make sure we have numbers we can compare year after year. And so I strongly encourage folks to start those conversations now. Great. Thanks so much, Luce. Um, so uh, just kind of on an ending note, uh, again, kind of why this matters, these, these two pieces, right? So we, we've talked a little bit about um, the revenue picture and that we're getting very close to uh, full implementation of LCFF. And I will stress, I mean, we put this in the slides and in the, the graphic, that that by no means means, uh, means that we have reached adequacy. We know that schools are dramatically underfunded and, um, and actually uh, the very definition of the LCFS target is that we're getting all um, districts up to pre-recession levels with some growth in COLA and we, we know that those pre-recession levels weren't adequate then. So um, what it does mean though is that the funding formula will be fully implemented and upon that full implementation um, there's a, just a lot more clarity in, in terms of, um, you know, the resources that are being generated by our most vulnerable kids, and it will also change um, how the growth in dollars um, happen over time. So those just are important things to consider as you're considering your local advocacy and, and um, local planning, um, because, again, I think you'll, have, you'll be able to have more concrete conversations um, about, about um, resources overall, and then especially for our most vulnerable kids. Um, and you'll have to think about it in terms of planning for new resources coming in. I, I, I think one of the points that Rob has shared with me in the past is that, you know, as we were getting to the target, um, there was all these, these cost pressures, um, and it may have been challenging to kind of get to the full level of, of supplemental and concentration dollars for our high-need kids. At the same time, when we hit that target, the expectation is that those resources are actually going to be used for those purposes. And so districts that, you know, were aggressively moving in that direction will probably be, you know, find themselves, you know, more comfortable around um, uh, making future allocations, whereas those that might have been a little bit, little bit slower um, are going to have to catch up really fast. So there's uh, just dynamics around that that you'll have to think about in terms of your local planning and your local advocacy, um, and right now is an important time to reflect. And then simultaneously, you know, with these new expenditure requirements coming online at the site level, there's a real opportunity to um, have those very candid conversations about um, how resources are distributed between sites. I mean, we know this is so much about, um, about people and, and again, I really uh, appreciate Luce's point. You know, this is not a blame game. This is just an opportunity to say, okay, if, if uh, a certain site has a whole lot of vulnerable kids and uh, the staff distribution is such that we've got a lot of turnover, whether that's teachers or principals or classified staff, um, such that, that when you look at the site expenditures, it's, it's relatively low um, because maybe they're newer staff, then that provokes a conversation. Okay, so maybe we need to be investing more mentor teachers, additional support, um, you know, uh, more uh, adults on the campus to really be providing um, services and access to kids. Um, so it, it, again, provides a good opportunity, but right now is the time when we're trying to figure out the, the, the rules of the game, and uh, again, as Luce mentioned, um, doing that well so that we have year-over-year -year, um, comparisons and can look at how things have shifted over time based on local strategy and, and the impact of local decisions will be really critical. So we encourage you to begin those conversations now and um, um, certainly reach out to us if um, you have you know, specific questions as you're engaged in that work. Um, and along those lines, we'll shift it over now to some Q&A. 
Um, we've gotten a few questions that have come in, and um, we'll see. We'll do our best to see if we can answer them. Um, the first is, uh, in Del Norte County, almost all of our kids are disadvantaged, including and especially on our tribal lands. How does this play out in isolated rural areas? I don't know, Luce or, or Rob, if you have any uh, initial thoughts on that. I'm sorry, Sam. Do you think that's referring to the site-based expenditure or, or or the meeting the LCFF target? I I, I think it might be around the. Do you remember when it came in? It, in it's order? in relation to the funding target. In in the funding target. Okay. Yeah. So um. So so these targets were basically ensuring that every um every district in the state got back to where they were in 2007-8, right? I, I mean, obviously, some districts with high portions of, of uh, low-income English learner students got beyond that, but, but most of this is ensuring that they got to the 2007-8 level. Um, in, in isolated rural areas, there is actually a, a, a slightly different formula that is driven off of um, basically the, the formula is driven by the number of teachers it takes to run that school, you know. And so this is for schools that have less than 200 kids, you know. And, and sometimes, you know, if you have 100 kids, then it's really well. You need five or six teachers, and that roughly costs us. So, so there's a separate formula that really drives those really isolated small schools. Um, but but getting to this initial formula will then allow that that isolated that those small school districts to grow in proportion to the rest of the system as well. And then uh, this question, I think maybe Lucy might be able to take on. Um, it says, as a member of a district parent council, what is the best way for us as parents to communicate that we are watching? Uh, what are the most important data points for us as parents to monitor? I think this builds on some of the earlier comments you made, but any additional thoughts? Yes. Um, I think, um, well, I guess I, I I would encourage you to, to communicate, not, not not just watching, but also wanting to to partner, right? The that idea that you, you've you got a stake in this and you're, you're willing to invest the energy and time to make sure the school district gets it right. Um, I do think if... A, one of the, as you're asking, what are the most important data points for us to monitor? Um, so if, I think um, asking your school district leadership, particularly CBO, to give regular updates either at board meetings or at budget advisory committee meetings or even at, at some of the parent meetings to say, hey, look, this is what we're thinking so far. Here's what we have in our mind regarding the methodology. Here's how we see it playing out allowing people to have a say in that process. Um, once, once the methodology is established, then it's a matter of watching that number every year. Uh, but I really strongly encourage you to have to participate in that process in advance by asking some of these questions. Um, and some of these are requests, right? Really, truly asking your school district, tell me what services and programs are you budgeting at our school sites and what do you budget centrally? Um, it'll give you, you, I, I will tell you, you will have a reaction, um, and it'll probably be a strong one when you see some of the services that are budgeted at school sites versus budgeted centrally, because it automatically leads, to, it will lead to some questions for you about why a district is choosing to budget one way or the other. Um, asking for those formulas, um, understanding what programs and services are based on student numbers versus student needs. Um, every school site is going to have a principal, of course. Every school site is going to have a principal secretary, of course. But then you can look at some of the positions that should be based on student needs, like counselors. If your school district is giving you a counselor for every 350 kids, okay, that's one way to think about it. But what about those kids who have high needs for counseling services? You might want to see them dig a little deeper into making sure that we're providing the services that our kids need. Thanks, Luz. The other thing related to that that came to mind was this, um, um, that 
while it is not required at the state, it's certainly something that local educators and um, uh, advocates can request, and that is um, to do some disaggregation of um, base versus supplemental and concentration dollars. So the federal uh, requirements say that we need to disaggregate the data by federal, state, and local. So that will absolutely be a, a part of the mix. But in the state bucket, um, there are you know there are base dollars and there's supplemental concentration dollars. So um, I know there are many districts across the state who who've already gone down this direction and you know use the account code structure um, and and tag the dollars by different sources. So it's technically possible. It's just a matter of, of you know, uh, having the, the political will locally and, and the ability to kind of look at it um, across, across sites. And Rob, it sounded like you were going to jump in as well. Yeah, I, I mean, so, so there's going to be variation across school sites. We know that at the end of the process. I think the goal for this to be a valuable tool is trying to understand the, the good reasons why that might be happening. So, for example, my high school, Santa Rosa High, um, was built in the 1870s. There's a new high school in the, across town that was built in the last 10 years. Those two schools are going to have dramatically different maintenance needs. Um, so, so there are good reasons like that. There, there may be that your elementary school is a hub where the district is serving the highest need uh, special ed students. Um, that's going to be a lot of resources at that school site. So, so those would be good, reasonable reasons for there to be um, differentiation in funding across school sites. It's trying to break that out from ones that are unintended um, to really get a sense of are there policies where the district just made a district-wide decision and maybe they made it in their LCAP or in their previous budgeting practices and it has unintended consequences in how those dollars are distributed across school sites. If it's we have a standard snapping policy, as Luce was saying, 350 students get your one counselor, then that's probably not going to work real well in, in creating equity. Thank you. Um, so we also got uh, two questions here related to uh, charters specifically. Um, so let me pose those. Um, the first is, um, which is, Will, can you actually read it, Eduardo, you're a little closer. Can you discuss how these approaches being developed specifically for charter schools, uh, charter school networks? So do the rules apply, and if so, how? And then the second piece is, uh, based towards the key context, will authorizer districts provide these approaches? Should charter networks create their own? Will districts have approval authorization of these approaches we develop? Uh, so, so with charter schools, I would say, as far as them figuring out their site level expenditures, they're already done, right? Because we fund the individual charter school. Um, what would have been nice is if if there if the state were providing some guidance here and providing some standardization statewide, then your charter school could start making comparisons to the resources that it is receiving versus the district school down the street. Um, that would be really helpful. Um, my guess is those comparisons will still happen um, because the district may be using a different approach than the charter. How comparable those are is a little bit uncertain, right? That's where some standardization uh, would have been nice to guide this process. But I still think it's going to be a tool for, for you to be able to compare resources between a charter school and, and neighboring schools serving a similar age population. And Rob, um, th so this plays out uh, this in the same way for charters that are part of a charter network, um, for your point, because the charter itself is the one that's funded, not the, the it's, it's, a charter network's not like a school district. Mike. That's right, that's that right. Um, you know, so obviously some charter networks have some funding that is not provided by the state, that's provided um, from a philanthropic organization that supports the CMO, you know, how those numbers will show up in in this reporting, I, I'm not certain, right? So that would be one area worth exploring, because uh, certainly having in, in those charter management organizations structured charter schools, that central operation can provide a lot of support. They can provide 
you know, that the professional development training, they can provide data supports to help uh, support instruction and those type of things are provided centrally. Um, so, so, so there will be probably some decisions of, made on how those charter management organization funds are, uh, are considered within this report. Great. Well, thank you both, um, Rob and Luce, for providing your expertise and, um, and for everyone on the phone being willing to jump on the line. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Eduardo, who's going to give you a quick update on uh, how we're going to send out the materials after the call. Thank you again. Yeah, so thank you, everyone, for joining today. Just as a quick heads up, we will be uh, sending you all a link to both the PowerPoint as well as to the recorded webinar as soon as they are ready. And that should be within the next 48 hours, so expect to see an email from us with that information. Also, if you have any questions, we encourage you to send any of them to info at childrennow.org, uh, as well as you have the direct contact information for the folks that were on this panel here, so feel free to reach out to them. There will also be a short survey following the ending of this webinar, where we would love to get your input. Let us know if there's any additional information that you'd like for us to cover in future webinars. Uh, as well as resources that we can help get out into the field. Uh, one other flag that I wanted to share is um, there's a document that we found that provided some really um, interesting ideas for how to think about, um, you know, developing these, these definitions locally. Um, the one caveat on that document is that it was finalized before the federal regs um, were pulled, and so there's some assertions in there about what the state needs to do and, you know, what these um, different, um, uh, you know, options might be locally um, and characterize them, characterizes them as requirements. We'll make sure that when we send out the materials that we clarify that they're not required, but um, that being said, there's just some good ideas in there and information that may uh, support your efforts locally. Uh, so again, thank you so much for joining us and we will follow up with all of those materials. Take care.